Member for Fremantle. Speaker, can I begin by joining with the other members and congratulating you on your election to the role uh, as, as Acting Speaker. I would also like to thank the clerk and the staff of parliament for their assistance since I became elected. They have been both professional and personable with assisting me as a new member of parliament and I am very grateful. I begin with the knowledge that the Fremantle electorate is situated in Wajak Ab Aboriginal land. They have been there in the past, they are still there today and they will be there in the future and I acknowledge that fact. Fremantle's European history began when the ship Challenger landed there in 1829. When we think of the history of Fremantle and its surrounds, we tend to think of the built environment. And while there is increasing acknowledgement of the original inhabitants, ignorance of their experience of the land is still pervasive. Last year, I attended a local series of talks, actually held around a campfire, surrounded by balga or grass trees, or taking place in the street where I live. These Noongar stories were designed to give an appreciation of local Aboriginal culture, focusing on the Fremantle area where the river meets the sea. It was a special experience, and I'd like to thank Noel Nanup and Bruce at Replants for their ongoing efforts to ensure our area stays at least a bit connected to its original Indigenous origins. I look forward to working with local Aboriginal groups in any practical measures to close the gap, not only in life expectancy, but to assist Aboriginal positive engagement with Fremantle and the local community. I'd like to place on record my appreciation for the people in the Fremantle Labor community who worked so hard to get me elected. Jean Hobson, Helen Mills, Zeta Powell, Phil O'Donoghue, Ron Meisen, Josh Wilson, M. Drake Brockman, Tim Kachura and Priya Brown, thank you. Thanks also to members of the Fremantle and Hilton branches. True believers all, I take very seriously the trust you and our army of volunteers have placed in me. I'm particularly indebted to my campaign director, Sue Ellery, who probably won't let me forget I said that. For her experience, firm hand, and at time during this campaign, and time during this campaign, thank you. We've been friends for a long time, and I appreciate her candour and moral compass. A big thank you also to my campaign manager, Dom Rose, who brought intelligence, a can-do attitude, as well as his family to the campaign effort. I'm very honoured to be representing Fremantle, a place I've called home for nearly 20 years, including while I was a student some years ago. Despite not growing up in the area, I have spent time in Fremantle since my early 20s when I, quickly became, when I quickly came to appreciate the variety, the verve and the coffee of old puppas and genos. There are many reasons people are attracted to Fremantle, not the least of which is its physical beauty. Of course, this has changed hugely since settlement, but the grace and the strength of the body of water where the river meets the sea is always impressive and Fremantle Harbour is no exception. Much of the Fremantle coast has been built upon, which is why my fellow South Beach lovers guard their territory so rigorously. These beaches, which extend south to Coogee, have a calm and lack of pretense that holds a special place in the community's heart. Horses are still walked and swim there, not far from the statue acknowledging C.Y. O'Connor's suicide on his horse in that water over 100 years ago. Not only does Fremantle have the magnificent Swan River and beautiful beaches, it's also steeped in history. A jail, the Roundhouse at Arthur's Head, is the oldest intact building in this state, built in 1830. There were some buildings in the area, but it was not until the convicts arrived 20 years later after settlement did significant construction take place. Fremantle Prison was completed in the 1850s and continued to be used as a prison until 1991. In the 1860s, the Fremantle Arts Centre was built as a lunatic asylum made from locally quarried limestone. This week actually marks the 40th anniversary of that building's very successful incarnation as an arts centre. In 1897, there were a number of significant civic openings in Fremantle. The Premier, John Forrest, laid the foundation stone of the Fremantle markets. Fremantle Hospital was first opened, as was Fremantle Harbour. That year, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Acting Speaker, another building was opened, but with less fanfare. William Knox, a merchant trader, built two modest semi-detached workers' cottages 
in what was then Alexander Road. He had three daughters, one who married, but the other two did not marry and lived together in one of those houses for the next 80 years. I have copies of photographs of the two women on the front veranda in their, and in their backyard of the house in the 1920s when the women were in their, in their 20s. Since the mid-1990s, I have been lucky enough to call that same house home. Can, can I recommend that if our current home builders, such as Alcock and Satterley, can build structures of lasting quality anywhere near houses like my own, they'll be doing very well. It's a tribute not only to good construction, but to activism that so much of Fre Fremantle's heritage building still stands today. I'd like to acknowledge the Fremantle Society, who in the past worked tirelessly to ensure these buildings remain. Some buildings, such as Victoria Hall, which hosted WA Labor's campaign rally, rally during the election, were protected by construction union green bands. Currently in Fremantle, there is a very active debate, in true Fremantle style, about future development and getting the balance right between protecting precious heritage, increasing inner city density and developing Fremantle so that it is equipped for the 21st century. Fremantle is a place of arrival where people from around the world and from all walks of life have chosen to call home. This is, in fact, one of our community's great strengths. European settlement, mostly Italian but also Spanish and Portuguese, enriched the community and as a result a much wider group, including artists and people seeking alternative to the mainstream, came to Fremantle and contributed to our ongoing vibrancy. We are still heavily indebted to the Italian and Southern European communities for choosing Fremantle and its surrounding suburbs as their home. We are very grateful not just for the cu their culinary con contribution, or this is, although this is very much appreciated, but their ongoing maintenance of many homeland traditions has brought a richness and diversity that is now woven into our community's makeup. An example of this is the annual Blessing of the Fleet ceremony, which I attended last year. First introduced to Fremantle by Italian migrant fishermen in 1948, it's a celebration of the fishing community's traditions, their religion, and it also involves the wider community by way of a procession through Fremantle. Fremantle's blessing of the fleet is unique as two statues are part of the procession representing the towns of Capodolando and Molfetta in Italy, from which the majority of our now local fishermen came. There are countless examples of southern European migrant resourcefulness and success throughout Fremantle. The only have to look at sea, lands, sea lanes, which started as a small family business in 1922 and is now the state's largest supplier to the food service business. While there are successes, there, are no doubt, there is no doubt there are also challenges facing many of the industries traditionally working from the Fremantle electorate. Over the last term of government, quotas in the rock lob lobster industry were introduced. And while the operators of boats working from Fremantle understand that sustainable fishing is necessary, they would like to see fairness applied so that restrictions are shared equally along the WA coast. They do not feel this is the case under the pre present system. And so I plan to work with their various representatives, bodies, to ensure the local industry is viable for future fishing operations. Both sea lands and the local, lo and the local rock lobster industry are now being led by the children of migrants. In both those cases, tertiary educated, um, those children want to maintain their family and cultural connections to the industries, but understand the need to be positioned into the 21st century. With what I've seen so far, I have every reason to believe they will succeed. Fremantle is, of course, not the only suburb in the electorate of Fremantle. The southern end of the electorate includes Spearwood, still containing market gardens and a strong migrant community, rapidly changing Coogee, Hamilton Hill, once referred to as Silly Town, because who would be silly enough to live that far south? It includes part of the Beelia wetlands and young families moving there now do not consider themselves silly at all. The electorate includes Beaconsfield and Whitecombe Valley, South Fremantle, known for the Bulldogs and the beach, Palmyra and at the northern end, East Fremantle. In short, Mr Acting Speaker, Fremantle appears to have it all. Graced with natural beauty, steeped in history, it has a vibrant working port and an active and engaged community but there are challenges. Fremantle is a heavy populated area situated on top of a working port, which now processes hundreds of thousands of containers each year, 
and that output will double before the port reaches capacity. Currently, about 86 per cent of those containers are transported by road, which on last year's figures equated to nearly half a million truck movements in and out of the Fremantle area. Given that diesel emissions are now classified by the WHO as a Grade 1 carcinogen, and those trucks contribute to already congested roads, there is a lot of support in my electorate for increased use of rail to transport freight. I welcome the current government's adoption of Labor's 30 per cent target of Fremantle's freight being transported by rail, and I look forward to holding the government to account to that target. Productivity of cargo movements must also be watched closely, where the point is to minimise the number of empty trucks coming in or leaving the port. It isn't just the volume of cargo coming in and out of the port, it's what is being transported that is of concern to the Fremantle electorate. Just last week, Roslyn Hill Mining announced the approval, that approval had been given for them to recommence the transport of lead through the Fremantle port. While there have been a number of safeguards put in place to protect workers in the community along the lead transport route, local public opinion remains highly concerned about the risks involved. WA Labor's policy is that the lead should not be transported unless it is in ingot form. I commit to doing what I can to ensure that safeguards are adhered to and there is zero tolerance to safety guideline transgressions when it comes to transporting this and other dangerous materials being transported in and out of the port. Another strong sentiment in the electorate that I represent is that of phasing out animal, live animal exports. This is not a NIMBY sentiment where as long as the animals were transported from Kwanana or away from site, the community would cease to care although the regular sight of sheep jammed onto trucks is distressing enough. I believe that the live animal trade is unnecessarily cruel and costs Australian jobs in abattoirs and in meat processing. I acknowledge there is a significant proportion of our state's agricultural industry rely, reliant on an, live animal trade, and so it would be necessary that there should be phasing out an adequate transition, as we have done in other industries we have exited. Like any, like any community, it is essential that Fremantle has services that meets its ends. As a major population centre, entertainment hub and with a working port, it's crucial there are accessible health services in Fremantle. There is concern that Fiona Stanley Hospital coming online in 2014 could actually mean a reduction in readily available health services, particularly for less mobile people in Fremantle. Worryingly, Fremantle's Hospital's Alma Street Clinic has given our community first-hand experience of the inadequacies of our current mental health system, confirmed late last year when the Director-General of Health, Kim Snowball, admitted the state's mental health system cannot keep pace with the level of demand. We can and must do better in this important area of health. Along with health services, proper public education is the cornerstone of a healthy community. Ensuring there are, sustain there are suitable public high schools in the electorate was also a matter of much debate during the state election. The demographics of the electorate have changed rapidly and I want to work with both John Curtin College of the Arts and South Fremantle Senior High School to ensure they have the resources to carry out their work and they are responsive to the demands of the community they are in. Far and away, the biggest issue raised with me while I was campaigning was the current state of central Fremantle. There are retail vacancies, buildings in disrepair, but rents are still high. There was a very active debate taking place around striking the right balance between maintaining Fremantle's cherished heritage, but ensuring the city is on the front foot for this century. Many of the issues being debated are in the remit of the Fremantle Council. I could share concern that forced council amalgamations would, amongst other detrimental outcomes, delay progress on council projects which are already overdue. In consolidating Fremantle as a regional metropolitan centre, there are a number of state, agency, state agencies which have crucial roles to play. The Fremantle Port Authority has responsibility for re major redevelopment at Victoria Quay and south of the Port Authority building near Bathers Beach. Any developments in this area need to be sensitive to the heritage value of the sites, but they have huge potential and they need to progress. There are opportunities in the responsibility of the Public Transport Authority too, in opening up the Fremantle train station, 
in opening up the Tr Fremantle train station. Both the FPA and the PTA need to work closely with local stakeholders to maximise the outcomes for Fremantle and play their role in economic regeneration. An example of state government neglect is in the heart of Fremantle, in the Waters Cottages next to the Fremantle Markets. These heritage cottages are owned by the Department of Housing, but despite record public housing waiting lists, they have been vacant for nearly two years and are now derelict. These are beautiful heritage structures in the heart of Fremantle, and it is, and it is an indictment of the current government that this has been allowed to occur. Some solution, which may involve the cottages being renovated and managed by the Fremantle Council, must be arrived at soon. What a vibrant Fremantle had in the past was employment, and while many of the local industries have either moved or are no longer employing in large numbers, I support this government's decision to relocate a major department such as housing to central Fremantle and for this to occur as soon as possible. Mr. Speaker, you would be, Mr Acting Speaker, you would be aware that the seat of Fremantle includes Rottnest Island, a very special place for so many West Australians. Here too, there are many challenges facing the successful management of this precious resource, but I am committed to ensuring that there is close attention to what sort of development takes place, that holidays on the island remain accessible and that the natural environment is protected. I'd like this afternoon to give credit to previous members of the free to seat of Fremantle. I'd like to acknowledge my immediate predecessor, Adele Carls, and in particular, I'd like to give credit to Jim McGuinty, who held the seat for 18 years and will be remembered for his significant achievements in advancing one vote, one value electoral reform in this state, as well as driving significant law reform in the area of gay and lesbian equality. He was, of course, a former secretary of the union now known as United Voice. Earlier this year, I was very pleased to meet with one of the other former Labor MPs who represented the seat of Fremantle, and that was John Troy. Mr Acting Speaker, I'd like to uh, ask for an extension of time. Extension, great. Thank you. Um, John was keen to impress on me that while planning issues have been much discussed as central to overcoming local government economic doldrums, in fact, in the past, it was employment that was the source of Fremantle's past vibrancy. I agree that it is crucial that we ensure the cent that central to the state government's responsibility is ensuring that there are real, stable and permanent jobs, which is why, as Secretary of Unions WA, I was pleased to work in cooperation with the union I was previously an official of, the AMWU, as well as the association representing ear engineers and planners and the steel employers in this state to lobby for local industry to gain an increased share of the engineering, design and manufacturing work associated with our big resource projects. As a result of that campaign, I think there was an increase in the amount of work going to local manufacturers. However, the increased work was patchy and done in a peaceful meal way. I believe that as policy makers, we have a responsibility to, miss, to be systematic as well as transparent in maximising outcomes from our large resource projects. Making sure we have jobs after the boom and, in fact, using the exploitation of our natural resources to nurture feeder industries is, is, is an issue that has continued to resonate strongly with the public and it is an area I am keen to continue to work on as a member of this House. Another policy area I believe we can do a lot better in is that of rates of vocational training. Despite concerted efforts by both federal and state governments, over the last five years, the number of apprentices in high demand skill areas such as engineering and construction have actually declined in a time of employment growth in these industries overall. In short, what we are doing to increase our apprentice numbers just isn't working and we have an obligation to redouble our efforts in this area. I spent over five years as a member of the State Training Board advising the government on vocational training matters and I also spent many years representing workers in the manufacturing industry as a union official. It's become clear that those employers who in the past have taken responsibility for indenturing apprentices, that is the large public sector em employers such as Midland Workshops or the State Engineering Works and also the large fabrication workshops, these are, are now not operating or they are not big employers. I believe we need to look at alternatives for, what, for who in the future will take on the responsibility for the important work of on-the-job training in these crucial and high-demand skill areas. 
Mr Speaker, as individuals, Mr Acting Speaker, as individuals, we're all the result of many influences. And I'd like to take this opportunity to give thanks to the trade union movement, who I have been greatly enriched by. I'd like to especially acknowledge individual delegates I have worked with over many years, as well as so many union officials, too numerous to name. John Sharp Collette and Keith Peckham were in leadership of the AMW when I went to work with the union as a young woman, and they mentored, support and gave me many opportunities so that I myself was in a leadership position of Assistant Secretary when I left that union. I believe that if women are to make significant inroads into non-traditional industries, deliberate decisions must be made by leaders at an organisational and industry level to actively promote women. Of course, this also applies to the many industries where women are underrepresented in numbers as well as in leadership positions. I also met my friend Carolyn Smith at that time when she was a boiler maker at the then Sequa. She became a union delegate and at that time at that time and of course now is very capably leading the state's largest um, and sorry largest union united voice. I wish her all the best in her important work. I'd also like to thank the staff who have worked with me at Unions WA. To all of you and to my successor as Secretary, Meredith Hammett, I would, like, I would say good luck, but we all know that luck has nothing to do with it. I know that the ability of the small but quality staff at the peak trade union body will ensure that its affiliates speak with one voice and that they are innovative and firm in giving West Australians, working West Australians and their families an effective voice in Western Australia. I will work hard during my time in this parliament to progress issues that will improve the lives of ordinary people. This is a natural progression of my union work, which has been all about giving a voice and strength to people who might not otherwise be heard. I feel that in this place we have a special responsibility to do what we can to even the ledger, to progress policies that progress equity and justice where it is lacking. Fremantle has a proud tradition of standing up to be counted. In 1919, Waterside worker Tom Edwards was killed by police in a union riot, Fremantle's own Bloody Sunday. I would also like to pay tribute to Paddy Troy, a Waterside union official who went on to form the Miscellaneous Workers' Union and the WA Trades and Labor Council. Paddy, father of John Troy I mentioned earlier, was fiery, compassionate and devoted to improving the lives of workers he represented. Above all, he believed in unity, and I hope this spirit of mindful militancy will help guide me in my present journey. Fremantle's rebellious traditions today manifest in a deep concern for the environment, a preparedness to take action and break new ground to ensure we are living sustainably. Labor's track record, if you'll excuse the pun, fits very well here, locally with our commitment to rail transport and, in particular, reopening of the Fremantle rail line in 1983 but also in ending logging in old growth forests and federally pricing carbon. We want to continue to pursue good policies that are practical measures to protect the environment we live in. Can I also acknowledge other important influences which have brought me to this place today? Arthur Clarke, Ken Travers, Roger Cook have all given me friendship, politics and a few late nights. Finally, what bigger influence can we have in arriving into adult than our own family? My father, Patrick, is here today and I thank him for his love. If I carry a tenth of his love of life with me, I will be doing well. His wife, Lois, provided as good a feminist role model as any teenage girl could want. But, Mr Speaker, it is to my mother, Betty, that I would like to pay special tribute to today. She brought up five children, often working two jobs and during times that must have been exhausting and difficult. We never did without and we have never been in any doubt as to her love and commitment to us. As they say in, cl in the classics, Bet, this one's for you. I've been graced with a tribe of nieces and nephews, so much so that some of them have had their own children and I am now a great, or as I like to say, an excellent aunt. It would take too long to list them, but you know who you have been, that you have been very special to me and it's been great to be part of your lives. Last but certainly not least, I'd like to thank my husband, Mark. Calm, creative and intelligent, he's provided unwavering support in all my pursuits and I'm very grateful for the love we share. I hope my time in Parliament isn't too exhausting for him. His, par his parents, Sam, uh, Pam and John, are here today and I'd like to thank them also for their support. 
The bonus of my relationship with Mark has been his son, Sam. Also placid, smart and creative, he put his talent to, on display creating a video for my election campaign. He's 21 next month and I look forward to sharing in the next chapter of his life. Mr Speaker, I believe in the responsibility we all have to extend inclusion and to afford opportunity and the power that will extend to our community if we achieve our aims. That concludes my address to the House. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.